turbos, like this unit from VS Racing, help us make lots of power. The problem with forced induction is heat. The way we combat heat? One of two ways, water meth injection or intercooling. The question now is, which one works better? In this video, we ran three different combinations. We had a turbocharged 5.3 liter, equipped with the Holley, you know, cast iron manifolds, and a single turbo. We ran the combination non-intercooled, then with non-intercooled with water meth injection, then with an intercooler. And in all three cases, we monitored the horsepower and torque, the boost pressure, and the charge temperature. We wanted to correlate the changes in power with the changes in charge temperature. As we found out, there was a lot more to it than just charge temperature. Before we get to all the cool turbo stuff, do me a favor. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. Come on guys, push those buttons, help me out. Let's get this thing rolling. To get things started, we assembled our 5.3 liter test motor. And this was a 5.3 stock block with forged internals. And I think it's a motor that I borrowed from David Freiberger, if I, if I remember right. Yes, it had, so it had a 10cc dish piston. Um, they were JEs. This actually had Trick Flow 205 heads on it. Uh, Brian Tooley Racing Stage 2 Turbo Cam, which was a 605 598. 226, 231, and a 113. It had a Dorman LS6 intake manifold on it. And we ran it with a Holley HP management system. So what we did was um, install a single turbo kit and we ran the Holley uh, iron exhaust manifolds the way they sell and then the crossover tube. And it ran out to a single turbo. In this case, we installed an S480 billet wheel turbo from LJMS. And we had a single Turbo Smart wastegate on it, one of their 45 millimeter uh, Hyper Gates. And we had a seven pound spring in it. And we decided to run it first with a uh, non intercooled before adding the water meth and the intercooler. So, in this condition, we ran it, and our turbo 5.3 liter produced 651 horsepower and 587 foot-pounds of torque. So it did pretty well. And this was at a boost level of around, we'll, we'll show you the boost curves for all the combinations later on, but this is around 11 and a half or 12 pounds. So what we did first of all, after running this is we installed a snow performance water meth kit, which I like really well. I like their pumps, I like their activation, their controller and stuff, all of that stuff works really well. We installed, uh, we tried running this a number of ways. We had um, a dual kit, so we had two nozzles, and we positioned both the nozzles in the discharge tube in front of the, after the turbo, but before the throttle body. And while we were running this, we also positioned a temperature sensor right in the intake manifold to measure the charge temperature in the manifold. As it turned out, that didn't give us a <laughs> the total picture of what was going on, but it did tell us the temperature that was happening right after the throttle body. We installed the water meth kit, and we did a lot of um, testing with the water meth because we wanted to find out what the optimum combination is of nozzle size because we had a number of nozzle sizes to try. We tried a single nozzle, we tried dual nozzles, we tried different sizes. We tried different scaling of the pressure when the activation was, what it, when it ramped up to 100. Basically, we did some tuning with the water meth to find the, the best combination. And here's what happened after we installed the water meth kit. As you can see, it was a little bit better than the non-intercooled version. And up until the very end, when we had a, kind of a what will turn out is we'll take a look at the boost curve. Um, we had a big spike in boost there at the end, so I'm not quite sure what happened there. The wastegate should be big enough to control all this because it has in a number of other occasions. And so I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, we did not have an electronic controller on it. Uh, we just ran it on the spring and on the gate. So maybe a controller may have cured that a little bit so you guys can <laughs> make comments about why, why that's a terrible choice. I'm sure I'll be hearing about that. But uh, later on, after we go through all the power curves, I'm gonna show you the difference in charge temperature between the water meth and the non-intercooled version, and the change in charge temperature was pretty substantial. 
and then obviously the change in temperature from the intercooled version and I'll also show you the boost curves for all of these as well but this is a change in power as you can see the only change we have here is a big spike at the end a difference in power and that's from a big change in boost so I'm not really using that as this example I think really up to 6,000 we kind of have honest results there so now let's take a look and see what happened when we ran the non-intercooled version versus an air to water intercooler After running the non-intercooled and water meth version, we installed an air-to-water intercooler. This was a Procharger air-to-water intercooler that we use for a lot of different turbo and supercharged combinations. It works well. It's able to support, you know, way over a thousand horsepower. So it was more than enough for the 650, 700 horsepower kind of range. We ran Dyna water through the air-to-water intercooler core, which is about 84 degrees um, in this case. So here is our non-intercooled turbo 5.3 liter, make it 651 horsepower. Here's what happened after we installed the air to water intercooler. So you can see we got a big jump in power. As a matter of fact, this thing made over 700 horsepower, the peak of 729, and torque was up to 637 foot-pounds of torque so the intercooler obviously the combination liked this quite well and we'll take a look at the charge temperature here, here in just a minute and also the boost curves because there's as always with any of these tests there's a little bit of controversy here because again I didn't use a uh, electronic wastegate controller to make sure that everything was perfectly stabilized I just ran them on the gate and then we made changes and the thing adjusted the way that it adjusted and unfortunately it, it raised the boost a little bit on this intercooled version so we'll take a look about we'll take a look at that and talk about how much of that is the boost and how much of it is just the intercooling now when you look at the difference in charge temperature you'll go yeah there's obviously some of it is definitely the charge temperature but this is the gain from the intercooler so now let's take a look at our boost curves and <laughs> we can all yell and scream about that that as a matter of fact I'm going to take a look at the charge temperature stuff first and then we'll talk about the boost curves and then we can get to our conclusion and then we can all yell and scream about it. It'll be awesome. Now if we take, now, a, look at <laughs> now if we take a look at the charge temperature offered by this combination, we see that on our non-intercooled version, we see a starting point of 106.5 degrees to be specific. And you can see during the run, it rose all the way up to a peak of 172.8 degrees. Now, the truth is it probably would rise a lot higher than this if we ran the, even at this boost level, if we ran it for a longer run than this, or we had started uh, without the thing being like cold because the dining room, you know, when we've got the fans going and stuff, everything's nice and cold. But we, uh, running the non-intercooled version is, is tough on stuff because especially a lot of guys will have these turbos in just an open engine compartment, which is terrible because honestly, the temperature in the engine compartment could be more than 170 degrees to start off with. So the turbo is drawing in that kind of air and then compressing it. And so you, you might see 270 degrees going into the motor, even at a relatively low boost pressure. So make sure that the, 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 the upshot is it make sure that you have cold air going at the turbo at all times like we did for this test. But we still had a rise in temperature and because this is a type K thermocouple, the response rate of the couple is not, you know, immediate, let's say. So the temperature probably is actually a little bit hotter than this. But this was our starting point. But let me show you what happened to our charge temperature. And we're monitoring this temperature. We have a temperature probe right in the intake manifold right after the throttle body. We drilled a hole in our manifold to put that in. So here's what happened when we put our water meth, our snow water meth injection on. Got a big drop in temperature, as you can see. It started out much lower, lower than 70 degrees, 68 degrees, and only rose to a peak of 86.7 degrees. So that's a big drop. I mean, you're talking about from 173 down to 86 degrees. So you can see through the whole run, 
it was a dramatic drop and the water meth kept the stuff fairly stable through the whole run it was working well at least the temperature right there after the throttle body in the common plenum was working very well here's what happened when we installed the intercooler in terms of charge temperature look i mean it's almost the same as the the temperature provided by the water meth as a matter of fact it's like almost an overlay for uh you know they're with they're all within one degree of each other so the water meth was working the intercooler was working <laughs> no intercooler obviously not working so now let's take a look at our boost curves and see what's going on there take a look at the controversial <laughs> boost curves so this is the boost curve of our 5.3 liter single turbo with that s 4 a non intercooled and remember we're just running it on the gate and the reason that's providing a rising boost curve is because we only have a single wastegate on this. The way that the Holly setup works, it's got an elbow coming off of the passenger side exhaust manifold. It's a single, basically three inch V-band outlet. And then we made an elbow with a single wastegate mount on it and also the mount for the turbo. And I think that the back pressure provided by the um, Holly exhaust manifolds probably was throwing the wastegate off a little bit. And maybe with just a single wastegate, did we, were we having a problem with maybe just that single wastegate being a little too small? Is that why we saw the, we'll, we'll show you why we saw the big increase in boost at the end. Let me know in the comments. Let me know what you guys think after we take a look at this. But this is our boost curve from the this combination with that single wastegate and a seven pound spring. This is non-intercooled. This is what happened when we installed the water meth. You can see the boost is very, uh, similar except at the very end there we saw a big spike and that's what we saw in the power curve too when we saw the big spike in boost we see a big spike in, um, in power there too and oddly enough we saw the same kind of thing when we had the intercooler on there now the intercooler was up by uh, this is like six or seven let's see 7.4 and 7.9 that's a that's like a half a pound that's six or seven tenths of a pound. And only at the very end, you can see it's it's very close to the water meth curve, but both of those are kind of up slightly from the non-intercooled version, especially at the end, which I'm not I'm not too concerned about what's going on there. We know that that's a big spike in boost and it happened both on the water meth and on the um, intercooled version. So we've got a little bit of a change in boost here, but as we see in the power curves, um, now these are our boost curves, if we take a look at the power curves of all three of these, which we can do very easily. So this is our non-intercooled, that's our intercooled, and this is our water meth. You can see that the water meth and the non-intercooled kind of make the same power other than the boost spike at the end. But with the intercooled version, there's a big jump in power everywhere. Now, the jump in power here is like, especially out here, let's say at 6,500, we have a change, well, let's not even look at that because that might be the boost, the change in boost. But even down here in the 4,500 to 5,000 range, like at 5,000 RPM, the non-intercooled version is making 572 foot-pounds and the intercooled version is making 635. So you're talking like 50 foot-pounds, that's a lot. And you're talking about, you know, the same kind of thing at 5,500 RPM, you're talking about a 50 horsepower difference. Now, if we had a change in boost of seven, even eight tenths of a pound, not even a full pound, there's no way that it's going to change it by 50 horsepower. Because for one pound of boost to change the power output by 50 horsepower, it would mean the NA motor had to make 735 horsepower. <laughs> and our NA little low compression NA53 with a stage two Brian Tooley Racing stage two cam is not going to make 735 horsepower NA. But that's what has to happen for you to get 50 horsepower per pound of boost. The NA motor has to be making that power. So some of it is the boost, definitely. You know, seven or eight tenths of a pound. Let's say that that's 20. Heck, let's say that that's 30 horsepower. That still leaves 20. In my opinion, it's probably not that much. It's probably about half that, maybe a little less. Um, so having the intercooler, definitely good. It's definitely good for power, obviously, as we see. But the other thing that it's good for is it's good for uh, safety. I mean, it's good for stopping detonation. We saw a dramatic change in charge temperature. Remember, it was 172 degrees or 173 degrees all the way down to in the 85 or 86 degrees. 
So that's a big change. You're talking about almost 100 degrees. And that's assuming optimized air and let into the turbo, which is sometimes not the case. Intercooling definitely works. Non-intercooled, not good. Water meth, does that work? Well, we're showing the here that it doesn't. But the reality is it actually does. As we saw from the charge temperature, it definitely works. And the reason that it didn't work here is because we had a distribution problem. Now, one of the tests that we did is we went in and put temperature probes in different runners, in different cylinders. And what we saw was a dramatic difference in charge temperature in different cylinders. Meaning that where we were measuring the difference in charge temperature, we were seeing a big drop right in the inlet behind the throttle body. So the plenum was getting a good charge temperature change. The problem is all that water and all that methanol was not making it evenly to all the cylinders. So if we could get that to happen, we would have that consistent charge temperature drop. We probably would see more power. At the very least, we know we would see more cooling in all the cylinders and they would definitely be safer. So we have, have extra fuel for the methanol, extra cooling from both the methanol and the water. So it would definitely be good. Even if we didn't see the gains that we saw with the intercooler, we definitely see more safety. So that's what I'd like to see. I want these water methanol companies to come out with individual port injection for the water methanol for these long runner manifolds. I know they already have stuff for things like the high ram and stuff, and you can get more even distribution with that and probably better with a single plane manifold too. But for these long runner stuff, the distribution on these uh, water mess systems, and again, we tried everything. We tried, the one thing we didn't try that everybody wants us to try is we didn't put the water meth in front of the turbo. But honestly, that's not gonna do anything for distribution in these long runner manifolds. It's not gonna change it one bit. It's not gonna help atomize it. It's not gonna chop it up. It's not gonna put it in finer particles. It's not gonna do any of that. All of this water methanol, as a matter of fact, you would lengthen the run that the water meth has to get to all of these runners if you put it in front of the turbo. Now maybe we would get a little more cooling and I definitely wanna try that. I'm definitely gonna try that before and after to see what the change is, but I know it's not gonna change the distribution. So, or at least I don't think it's going to. But again, you gotta test. Um, I think uh, <laughs> the takeaway from all this is I wanna have intercooling and if I'm gonna run water methanol injection, I would run, wanna run a different intake manifold. But hey, let's get to our conclusion. Okay guys, what did we learn from all this? <laughs> because the boost wasn't the same, does it totally invalidate the complete test? I'm sure I'll get a lot of comments like that. And please, let me know what you think. Don't hold back. Here's my takeaway. Non-intercooled, that's the worst way to go. Anymore, I don't think I'd run non-intercooled for any combination, unless it was a blow-through carburetor, and the carburetor actually provides some form of intercooling. It'll lower the charge temperature by as much as 100 degrees. But what about the water meth? Now, I think the problem is not with water meth injection, not with it in general. I mean, it works well. Obviously, we saw it lower the charge temperature. The problem was with this particular type of intake manifold, this long runner manifold that was designed to flow only air is not great at flowing water and methanol. I mean, the ideal situation would be not to have a single nozzle or dual nozzles, because we tried both, but to have individual nozzles, one for each cylinder. That way we could provide the right amount of water and the right of methanol, because let's face it, that's some of the fueling. So we want to have an even amount to all the cylinders. Ideally for me, I like intercooling. I mean, you might want to supplement with water meth injection or run it if you don't have intercooling because a lot of guys can't fit it in their combination. And then there's only one choice, but I would like to see for these long runner manifolds, individual port injection for the water meth. So guys, if you aren't already doing it, make sure you make that kind of combination. I'm Richard Holdner. Thanks for, thanks for watching. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. Let me know what you think. Thanks for watching, guys.